Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, let's begin. Check-ins. Uh, my stomach hurts. I feel a little jittery, but um, there's like a, a calm excitement about this talk today. So welcome to the STOA. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA. The STOA is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And today we're very lucky to have our friend Jeremy Johnson at the STOA. Um, and uh, maybe Gray will do an introduction on Jeremy and she'll be running the MC portion of today. Um, so I will allow her, I'll send it over to her now and allow her to uh, explain how that is going to go. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, did I give that? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. So, yeah, today I'm going to be emceeing uh, this talk with Jeremy Johnson about liminality. Uh, Jeremy Johnson is the co-founder of Liminal News, which is at liminal.news. It's a digital magazine, um, and it's just, it's covering all sorts of strange topics that are relevant to the meta crisis, like prophecy and the pandemic and um, uh, the occult, all sorts of just, all, all my favorite, most spookiest things. <laughs> so I'm very excited to talk to him. He's very much like uh, interested in things that are dear to my heart. Um, I uh, want to ask maybe, Jeremy, if you could start by giving us a little bit of your view on like what liminality is and why it's important and uh, what it has to do with the structure of feeling uh, that's going on uh, underlying this whole meta crisis. Sure. Thank you for, first of all, having me on today. It's an honor. Uh, maybe great. And Peter, both of you, it's been uh, great to get to know you and uh, get familiar with uh, the Stoa community. A lot of great, great minds here and uh, great people. So, yeah, I mean, just in terms of uh, how I understand, we got a little echo. Um, yeah, just in terms of how I understand the term liminality, um, you know, obviously uh, I'm co connecting it to the meta modern theme of a structure of feeling, right? And that's the that famous essay notes on meta modernism. Um, and I was really drawn to the concept of meta meta metaxi, which means sort of being in between as an ontological state. And that's really something that I explored um, in my side view essay, just talking about meta and modernism. And it really sort of ontologically expresses the feeling that so much of us have today in terms of just feeling like so much of what we were previously standing on in terms of institutions, uh, forms of sense-making, understanding self and world, time and space, etc., are breaking down. And there's no real clear sense of what's emerging through that. There's bits and pieces of that, but even those bits and pieces, right, those innovations that we're, we're kind of holding with promise also have a kind of a Janus-faced nature to them. I'm talking about the internet and digital technologies and um, networks, etc. So it, it's just interesting. We've seen this kind of flux of innovations, and then those innovations also kind of being captured and exacerbating the crisis at the same time that they're also offering some kind of promise, right? So everything's really wrapped up in this promise and peril together. Um, and we ourselves, I feel like, are in this process of trying to reorient ontologically towards, um, you know, I, I could get into this a little bit, but what is the new ontology uh, that the climate crisis and that this meta crisis is teaching us, right? Because we can take in a, in a sort of liminal fashion, the same issues, the same kind of breakdown and flip that over and consider it from another angle and see what it actually is teaching us. So that's kind of how I understand it. But liminality also has kind of um you know, this magical con connotation in terms of, uh, you know, my colleague Daniel Pinchbeck uh, talks about this in terms of initiation and sort of being in a transitional or liminal state is, is part of the process of transformation, right, on a, both, both a cultural and a personal uh, level. So that it's, it's factoring that into, into the equation as well. So it's a being in between and as a structure of feeling of being in between. And then we can get into more details in terms of what that phenomenologically actually means, like 
what are those qualities and what is breaking down, what is arising, but just to start there, yeah. And uh, I don't know if we wanted to just keep going or if there's more orienting questions, but I could just keep <laughs> ranting about that. Uh, if you have something that's like alive for you, that's like makes sense to be the next thing to talk about, I'd love to hear what you've got to say. Cool. Uh, well, I was just going to mention that that, um, that that the founding of the of the magazine is kind of in this of liminal is sort of in this extension of you know, uh, Daniel was one of the founders of Reality Sandwich Magazine, and I've always had this appreciation for what I call just countercultural media, countercultural publishing. You know, there was disinformation, there was the kind of the high weirdness of Mondo 2000, um, and dig um, high frontiers back in the 80s. So there's a kind of an interesting countercultural edge between psychedelia, consciousness exploration, the occult and magic, and then digital utopianism and cyber philosophy, et cetera. And there's just a long history of that. And recently, you know, I've just felt, and I think it's just sort of also part of like the pandemic starting to happen. It was just the right time. It was just, it just seemed to be the right time to bring this forward and start talking about innovation solutions uh, side real ways of looking at the crisis and hoping or yielding some kind of insight in in that fashion. So, um, yeah, I would actually love to hear more about uh, why you think that uh, liminality is such an important uh, subject for us to be talking about during the pandemic. What kind of opportunities do you think there are that are like unique to this uh, unprecedented situation uh, that that liminality is like just primed to unlock the potential in? Oh, good. Great question. Great question. Uh, so a few things. Um, in one sense, and this is what I mentioned in the essay, um, I think liminality is in some way intrinsic to the emergent ontology and what I understand to be a sort of an integral ontology, um, uh, the, the ontology of the planetary crisis, but also of the Anthropocene. So the fact that it is open-ended and process oriented and involves time as it's, as it's very theme, I think is intrinsic to something that we need to learn as a culture in terms of complex dynamical systems, uh, living systems, feedback loops. I'm very inspired by um, uh, the, the work of, of Jean Gepser, who was an integral philosopher in the mid 20th century. And he writes quite profoundly and quite presciently about these themes. Um, but it also, it also shows up in various philosophies like Tim Morton and hyper objects and object oriented ontology. So is this theme of being in between is actually a kind of mode of being that we are not very used to as a culture in terms of inhabiting successfully. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of essays that we brought on to Liminal, like I'm thinking of Matt Segal's essay, uh, uh, Towards a Gaian Reality, right? Where he's talking about whitehead and process philosophy and needing to incorporate a kind of a process oriented view of things. Um, but what I like about what, he, about what he says here, right, is that this process-oriented view um, is not just something that's human created, but he calls it a kind of a cosmological power where we derive our human values from. So liminality is just sort of a gateway concept to begin talking about this different mode of thinking and perception that we really need to learn very quickly. And I would also draw from McLuhan because McLuhan talks about this as the kind of... Um, you know, when you, for him, it was, you know, he has a different vocabulary, but it's the sense of needing to bring all of the different cultural ecologies, all of the different um, modes of human communication that have existed across, you know, thousands of years, a whole human history, into the forefront, being able to access all of that in a very pliable way. Um, and then needing to almost be simultaneous in that sense, that the past, the present, and the future are in some sense coexistent with each other. Like this is the only way to really navigate the planetary complexity is to inhabit that mode of being somehow. Um, and we're still learning to do that. I think that has so much to do with what kind of sense making we're learning today. So I don't know if that's a direct answer, but that all has to do with this theme of liminality, um, this theme of process, this theme of temporics that I think is just absolutely just so essential to, to start exploring. 
Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, one one thing that comes up for me as you uh, kind of like delve into that more is that uh, we do want to be able to learn these new techniques and like broaden our repertoire as a collective intelligence very quickly. Um, and I imagine that one of the things that holds us back the most from being able to do that is like a cultural discomfort with uncertainty. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we could work with liminality and get more comfortable with the sort of uncertainty that it demands from us. Mm, yeah, uh, th this is definitely uh, like Daniel and I talked about this during a, a live stream with liminal um, in terms of conspiracy theories. Um, we want to, and this is, I think it's a very natural reaction to reach for certainty in this time, to collapse a metanoic understanding into a paranoic certainty, right? To just kind of go, okay, it's really just about this cohort or this cabal. That's what's really going on. So I can understand and navigate that. And it's interesting that so much of the language around conspiracy theories, for instance, is, is very often concerned with sovereignty, concerned with understanding, you know, what's really going on and waking up. So uh, to me, like that's just, it's, it's a very human reaction to information overload and complexity. But I also think um, the, the, again, the, the medium in which we're swimming on the internet, through Facebook, through Twitter, we've gotten very good at creating these networks, but we aren't using them, um, or we aren't designing them for coherence. We're designing them for fragmentation. And there's uh, socioeconomic incentives for that as well that like, let's say Douglas Rushkoff talks about. So the media in which we're swimming in is engendering this overwhelm, right? And I think people are reaching for certainty in that sense. So how do we, re how do we get more comfortable with uncertainty? I think part of this is, is recognizing those compulsions and desires for certainty as we're navigating these media spaces. You know, it's, it's, it's a very internal work right now, but it, it shouldn't just be that, you know, like what we really need to be doing is designing these spaces with coherence and human centric um, you know, principles in mind, and, and many different theorists are talking about that. Um, uh, I think I would bring up uh, Michelle Bowens, who's on Liminal as well, sort of discussing how to better utilize peer-to-peer -peer networks and design them, uh, not only socially, but also economically. He talks about the commons, et cetera. Um, and he has, a, he has a fantastic essay on, on Liminal as well that's a very kind of Gebserian take. Um, it's called uh, Corona in the Commons. Um, and that's sort of, again, more of the macro perspective of what's going on. Um, but at the heart of it, you know, what he's talking about is, is really trying to learn um, uh, what he calls a pedagogical catastrophe, like take what's going on and really kind of read into, um, so a crisis teaches us what we haven't been looking at, right? So how are we falling? How are we collapsing? What are the stressors and what are they actually teaching us, you know? Um, and I bring this in too, in the terms of in terms of liminality, um, you know, liminality is is a different mode of time. You know, it's disruptive in the sense that, just like the pandemic and just like the protests that are going on right now, um, there's a certain intensity that comes to the forefront, and especially with the pandemic, the discussion was centered around this sort of pausing, right? This um, release from the forward motion of our culture, right? The momentum of the forward motion of, of, of the machine of, of capitalism. Suddenly it stops and that's a disaster for that machine, right? So we begin to ask, well, why can't we stop? Why can't there be a steady state? Why can't there be pauses in that forward momentum? Different types of rhythm, different types of time. And of course, what goes along with those is different ways of being in the world. Um, so I think the kind of radical inquiries that we can make in this crisis are um, in some sense um, providing profoundly valuable insights into, okay, how do we live in an alternative way, right? How do we actually um, step out or actually imagine something beyond capitalism, right? Um, and it's certainly something that we're, we're exploring at, uh, at Liminal as well. Right. I think that uh, a lot of aspects of the meta crisis are things that we really wouldn't have been able to contemplate before it happened. And it's interesting to me, um, usually a cautionary tale is something that uh, the, the characters in the story leave behind for the people after 
to try to understand and do something different. But there's this strange way that the pandemic has given us a pause where we, the characters in a cautionary tale, can stop and think about what we might be cautioned about in the tale and see if we can make a better decision for the people already in it rather than waiting for the next generation to try to understand what this all means. Um, what do you think we can do right now to um, stay open um without like having too broad of a scope uh there there is so much information there is such an opportunity be, to be overwhelmed how do we um be more expansive and more exclusive at the same time yeah great question well i think that the first thing that you mentioned um it's, it's something I, I i take from McLuhan all the time and i, I use it at the end of my side view essay where he's like we suddenly need to be aware of everything that is going to happen and all the consequences of what's going to happen before it happens. And that's just how we have to navigate the present now. I think that is such a great, and he was talking about that in like the 60s or 70s, right? Um, so I think that is such a great way of thinking of, okay, how, what is the mode of sense making for human beings living in the 21st century? Um, it is this different sense of time and system and ecology in terms of seeing the whole field of relations. Um, but you're right, there can be kind of an overwhelm with this, right? The overwhelm is, is well, what is the coherence, right? Is it a meta system that I need to follow? Is it a meta theory that can help me navigate this? Is it just this structure of feeling, right? But I think we can actually unpack that structure of feeling a little bit without needing to create a singular system or a singular narrative. Um, what, what I go to anyway is, is anyone who's, so I think part of this has to do with cultivating a kind of, a, um, an artistic sensitivity to the present and understanding, um, where we want to get to in terms of a better world out of this crisis, navigating out, but then also what the crisis is actually showing us what that better world can be. And it's not something that is utopian in the traditional sense of, I'm going to abstractly conceive of a better planet where we're all peaceful, but rather let me really listen to the present and really listen to the crisis in that pedagogical sense and hear what it is showing us, right? So it's, just, it's, it's revealing us, uh, is revealing to us the need to be entering into different modes of time and space, to be pliable, to be adaptable. Um, I draw from David Graeber a lot in this sense of, um, you know, he talks about how, you know, early human societies in the Paleolithic would, would actually be quite dynamic. They would be um, totalitarian in one season, and then they would flip it and become egalitarian in the other. And agrarian societies sometimes would be profoundly egalitarian rather than hierarchical. So the question of, of a kind of the, the historical question for us is why have we become so fixed? And we clearly can't be fixed anymore. We have to become dynamic socially, politically, economically. We have to be pluralistic. And I think part of the problem is we've become so rigidified or fixated on that, again, that very forward motion, the ideological, economic, industrial forward motion. So what can engender a different kind of culture that isn't like that, right? The crisis is showing us that this is what is being called forth in the moment. Um, and then I, I use this as a, as a helpful uh, a frame uh, of reference, but Bruno Latour talks about in his book, uh, Down to Earth, uh, the arc of modernity is over, right? Time in that sense is, has, has completed itself. There is no more forward motion. And anyone who's talking about that, like let's continue with progress or let's go back to a better time is sort of stuck in this oscillation that is just flinging out of this world. And what's really going on, the new ontology and the new subject is being reoriented towards the terrestrial, the coming down to earth. So I think any of these processes that are going, hey, you know, humans have these innate tendencies towards mutual aid, uh, life and nature is a process of symbiogenesis, right? Cooperation and a making with, sympoiesis. Um, and the climate crisis is forcing us to recognize that and realize that it is the ultimate coming down to earth, becoming terrestrial. And the more our politics and our social systems and our social imaginary can 
go in that direction, come back down to earth, I think that's a good coherence. That's a good principle. You guys have had on uh, uh, Joe Brewer's work. I think what he's doing is a great example. Like, how do we live as a society um, post-capitalism? What kind of economics, um, what kind of literacy in terms of bioregionalism are we going to need? Um, what does a post-capitalist future actually look like, right? So I think there's many different expressions of that, but I think we can at least cohere around this is, this is certainly like what Jordan Hall was talking about, like as big as the, you know, or bigger than the Renaissance or Industrial Revolution, but it's a sort of a counter. It's kind of a reversal. Um, and so any of these kinds of themes, I think, can really help us cohere the massive complexity of what's going on and actually kind of lean into certain tendencies that are not abstract, they're concrete. These, this is the way, you know, this is the kind of um, the gravitational pull of the present. Um, but it has to begin with the structure of feeling like, like I talk about in my essay, or else we're just going to meta ourselves out of this world, like Bruno Latour warns us about. So let's cohere, but cohere by listening to the present and listening to what the crisis is actually showing us how to be. It's not, it's not that difficult, but it also is profoundly difficult because I think we're, we find it difficult as moderns to do that, right? Uh, let alone, you know, with the, with the kind of momentum our civilization has uh, that is acting against this. So, uh, yes, long story short, we have to listen and be present, I think. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question before I start um, uh, calling on people who are putting their questions in the chat um, to give you their questions. Um, for you guys who are putting questions in the chat, just so you know, this is being recorded and maybe posted on YouTube. So if you'd prefer for me to read your question for you, uh, just leave some sort of an indicator along with your question and I'm happy to do that. Um, so yeah, Jeremy, my last question for you before I uh, pass things off to the collective intelligence a bit more is uh, how do you think the uh, myth of stability that has existed around our uh, social institutions has created like blind spots that are very unique to this generation? Mm -hmm. The myth of stability. I mean, you know, I think this is something, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, um, and I talked about this right as the pandemic was starting, like people started talking about supply chains and growing gardens and like more and more people like the, the what was seen as some hippie utopianism, right? Like, okay, yeah, there could be a better world, but the, the realism of this world is such that those things are nice ideas that might kind of work their way into the center gradually. We're suddenly in a disruptive moment where the center is just falls out from beneath us and its stability, its, its concretion is just completely in question. So the, 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 the cynical remark about this it's, is that it seems that until the, the ground beneath us falls out in this way, the way that we are living through right now, um, it doesn't, it, it remains an abstraction. It remains a hypothesis. It remains, um, uh, a daydream or a reverie of, of the culture uh, to imagine itself in a better place. But when that stability falls out, it's a false stability and it always has been, it's been very tenuous. But when that falls out, I think that's when we begin to intensify and give permission to actually rethink the center. Um, but it's very helpful when we have better coherence about what this new center could be. So I, I would say there's been a kind of reversal um, where the previously utopian, and more beautiful world, you know, that Charles Eisenstein talks about is suddenly like, oh, that would actually be great right now. It'd be good to have a backup plan for my family because I don't know if I could get bread or if gas goes out or if a supply chain uh, goes out in the next coming years, you know, uh, it would be great to have some kind of alternative and resilient plan. And I think these are the kind of things as the system systems buckle and collapse, the innovations come forward. like. You know, we, we saw this happening in real time in the United States where the federal answer to the pandemic was no longer being addressed in, in terms of coherence. And so local, regional, almost commonwealth started arising about like how to strategize reopening or not, or how to uh, um, source the, the medical supplies that they needed. Um, 
so on the one hand, this seems like fragmentation, but on the other, again, if we take this theme of a perspectivity that Gebser talks about, um, or Latour is talking about with the terrestrial, um, that th there may be a better answer in terms of, you know, nation states are perhaps not the best expression of uh, a planetary polity, you know, and decentralization is something that we actually have to learn now for the first time. We we're doing it with networks and digital culture and communications, but have we really, really reworked society at that fundamental level? We're still using, you know, you know a thousand, two thousand year old institutions to think about planetary dynamics. Maybe those don't work. Maybe our institutions need to reflect the networks that we're communicating in and the living systems that we're increasingly learning more about. So, and that's a bigger, like, well, holy crap, that's like a, and that's not just a civilizational turn. That's like ontologically as profound as, as what Morton talks about with the, the Anthropocene, the human becoming nature and the nature becoming human. And this is also something that I think both McLuhan and Gebser talk about in their own ways, but Gebser particularly where he talks about transparency, the supersession of these modernist dualisms um, are, are finally being overcome. But the problem is, right, the crisis is, can we overcome them or will they overcome us? Can we outlive the crisis or will it outlive us? And th that is immediately and directly related to what we can draw from what's going on right now, how deeply we can listen and cohere and respond to it. Um, yeah, so that was a great question, though. I mean, this is the question, right? This is the question we're all trying to figure out and entertain right now. <laughs> Better hope the internet doesn't out. I, I saw Tom's comment there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, interesting, Tom, and and just a sort of a comment too, like um, William Irwin Thompson has this concept back in the 70s. And I think this is great. It's from a little book he wrote called Darkness and Scattered, uh, Scattered Light, where he hypothesizes basically in a McLuhan turn, a reversal back to the village. But he says, no, no, this will be the meta industrial village where localization and regionalism, et cetera, and decentralization will occur, but through digital networks, like we'll be okay. We can kind of retrieve um, uh, the pre-industrial world in a kind of new new expression. Um, that might be one model, I don't know, like, but we need to be considering these kinds of expressions and models. The Stoa Village, nice Peter. <laughs> anyway, I, sorry, I, I'll open it up to, to you Anna, to facilitate these questions. Uh, yeah, I, I know Peter uh, had a question uh, having to do with uh, liminality and the sort of mimetic uh, environment that we're in right now, if you want to unmute yourself. Cool. Thanks, maybe. Yeah, I wrote it down, um, a longer version of it. So uh, I'm running with this concept uh, called the, the liminal war, and I'm viewing it as sort of like an upgraded version of the culture war, where it's like this confusing, disorienting, like hyper-fragmented battle of narratives in this liminal state that we're in. Um, and I like what you and maybe were talking about, about building a good relationship with liminality, uncertainty, annoyingness. Um, but however, in this like a liminal war, there's a lot of like mimetic tribalists that are demanding us to take a position. And uh, even if they're right propositionally, uh, a lot of them are coming from a place of having a bad relationship with uncertainty. And, um, and even, like there's a lot on the line right now, you know, there's a meta crisis and existential risks and all that type of stuff. But and so if we're talking about, you know, this like building a good relationship with liminality or uncertainty, people are saying like, you know, fuck off, you know, just take a side, you know, like, you know there's, there's no time for this. Um, so how would you respond to that? Because uh, I do agree with you. I think this is a very, very important task. How do we cultivate a great relationship with liminality, uncertainty and all this stuff, but at the same time, you know, respond to the meta crisis and sort of negotiate those relationships of people are coming to you and, and basically gaslighting you to take their position. Good question. And it's, it's something that um, I've been thinking a lot about in terms of uh, some of Gepser's insights on, because uh, he, he has this sort of general understanding of this unfolding of consciousness with different structures and they all kind of still play out um, in, in very interesting dynamics. And I think totalization um, and oppositionalism and this hyper fragmentation that are that are again our networks are engendering to a great extent um, is is unfortunate. Um, but in terms of how to react or how to respond or cohere with that, um, 
I don't think liminality means not acting or not being comfortable taking a, uh, an action that we would be perceived as a side. Um, I think the real capacity to be liminal is to actually kind of say, yeah, I agree with that, or yes, I'll, I'll take this stance with you and still re render it transparent in a sense. Like I'm gonna engage with you ethically, morally, because we should and we ought to. I don't agree with the kind of totalizing way you're coming down on that, but I do agree that, you know, you're expressing something, let's say, I don't know, let's go protest, right? Let's go out right now. Um, let's join. We feel our hearts are calling us to go down and, and, and do so. If somebody says you have to do it, whatever, you know, like, but go ahead and do it if you feel called to do it, right? Like, I, I think this shouldn't hinder us from having action and then also rendering those actions transparent to the sort of larger meta sense that we're talking about here, right? Like, I very often talk about this, this whole election cycle um, and the, the, during the pandemic, right? There are certain policies, there are certain um, legislative policies that are being enacted and they're very polarized in terms of the political landscape. Nevertheless, I think it's good to enact and participate without feeling like we're, you know, in that sense of being in the world, but not of it. You just have to go forth and, and, and do what you gotta do, you know? So I, I think for us, the harder part is to participate without getting stuck or without um, a, acquiring the totalizing perspectives that tend to crop up everywhere, right? How do we navigate that? It's very difficult. We have to, in a sense, be mediators. And also in another sense, we have to be kind of um, uh, attempting to cohere and render transparent this larger process and why we're acting. And I think that's a very difficult task because again, our communication media is just encouraging us to take a totalizing viewpoint, right? It's, it's, it's wanting us to collapse complexity into yes or no. Um, can we still say yes or no? Can we still act and not collapse into that mentality? It's very difficult, but I think this is at least the start of what we have to do, right? Like uh, you guys have had uh, Michael Brooks on and, um, you know, Michael Brooks is a good, is a good friend of mine. And we've talked about this before too, in that sense of, you know, um, absolutely these sort of meta processes are really important and there's something you can do right now. And actually maybe by participating in that and leaving the window open to these sort of more macro meta perspectives in the communities you're engaging with that are very hyper-polarized, I don't know, maybe some of them will come on board with that and be more interested in that because there's a bigger coherence, right? There's a bigger, uh, I don't know, um, well, what we were talking about before, a larger sense of the process that's happening and how they're a part of it, you know? Like say yes to them and, and show them that they're a part of something that's just more than, you know, the entrenchment of the mimetic wars, right? Easier said than done, but um, I don't see, I don't see an, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, uh, a kind of a rest between, taking an action with a perceived stance and um, still being in this liminal space, right? If that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think Walter, your, your question uh, might, might be an interesting place to go from here if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hey, thank you. Um, this is kind of a very open-ended question, so please just interpret it however you want. Um, I was asking uh, some people, for example, Erica Lagalise uh, in her book, Occult Features of Anarchism, have pointed out that conspiracy theorizing is more common among people without college education. And then on the flip side of that, we see sort of a, creden a credentialism that appears in people with college degrees where they sort of have a habit of thinking that if something was published in a journal or comes in a fancy packaging with a lot of uh, acronyms and stuff, that it's true. Um, and it seems like both of those placeholders are there to avoid saying, I don't know. And I'm wondering if your project is in part or mostly about finding out more productive ways of saying, I don't know, while still being productive in the world. Yeah, great question. And that's also a great way to kind of also respond to Peter's inquiry too. Like, I don't know. I'm going to participate. I still don't know. Right. I think that's very helpful to frame it that way. Um, but 
Yeah, I, you know, I, th I think so. I mean, you know, Daniel and I talked about this in terms of like maybe part of Liminal's role as, um, as a media space in the consciousness culture uh, could be to help verify and cohere conspiracy theories and try to avoid the, the, the most reductionist elements of it, while not necessarily like um, removing the capacity of our own you know, subjectivity to have some kind of validity, right? Our own insights and intuitions and experiences. Like it's, it's, there's no easy answer. Um, but one of the things I do remember actually from that, from that particular book is that, you know, sometimes, and this is something Brooks mentions as well, um, by way of William Irwin Thompson, but sometimes conspiracy theories can be very interesting if we flip them again and look at what they're actually you know, implicitly talking about, you know, they may be caricatures or, or sort of um, two-dimensional expressions of a very multi-dimensional and complex process of power dynamics, but they might reveal something actually about those power dynamics in a way that is accessible, right, and almost folkloric. So there's ways in which we can even be friendly to these narratives and think about them in a way that, um, uh, no, I don't know, this is just this is just how I've approached it in the past. I don't know if you know a conspiracy theorist would appreciate being interpreted in this way and sort of almost in a sense psychologized in this way. Um, but nevertheless, I think they do express something um, about what's going on and it, and it should be addressed. It's just sort of done in a very kind of literalized fashion. And so if we can, again, hold that lightly and not go along with the literalisms, maybe we can learn something from a particular conspiracy theory about I don't know, the flat earth or something along those lines. Um, I'm just bringing up flat earthers as, as one of the more extreme examples. But um, for them even, you know, I think that there's this desire to return to a measurable world, right? Um, a, a world that they can enclose themselves in. There's a sense of um, a, a loss of world right now. It would be very good if we could go back into the enclosure of the, the unperspectable dome that they, they often talk about. So, you know, these things can tell us more about our own human compulsions and desires, and uh, we can sympathize with them. But um, yeah, I don't know if that's a direct answer to your question, though, but uh, that was a good one. Cool. Um, I, I think Ron has a really interesting question that he's asked me to read on his behalf. Um, he feels that um, progress and capitalism for a lot of people are very tightly associated with freedom. Um, and he wonders uh, how you see a, a post-capitalist world as uh, compatible with personal freedom and autonomy rather than, than some, some place where we would have to give that up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Um... Yeah, so I, I think we have to, of course, think about this in, well, uh, in, in this sense, you know, capitalism and modernity certainly give us this gain, which is this, uh, Gebser talks about this all the time, this, this new sense of phenomenology of being a self moving through the spatial world, directing their will and their reason and their measurement, and in a certain sense, molding the world to their, their will and revealing the world in that, in that sort of egoic sense. It helps shape the self in that very um, perspectival material sense. There's an autonomy and elation in that. The, the double side to that, right? The other side to modernity and you know, everything that it has brought forth is a loss of participation in the living world, right? There is this freedom and release, you know, uh, Charles Taylor talks about this as well. Many different theorists talk about this, right? The sense of the buffering of the self that emerges through um, this, this newfound spatial being, being an ego, subject, object, relationality, and duality, and so on. Um, but the downside of that is there's a cutting off of participation in these other modes of experience that you know, pre-modern times had. And then of course, there is the gains and the losses of actually you know, the process of capitalism and industrialization and, and, and the, the de-villaging and deculturation of the world, right? The loss of craftsmen, the feeling that, um, this is something Gebser also talks about, ex manu, the emancipation, it means out of the hand, right? What is being emancipated? The self is released into the world, 
but we've also lost control of the very, those very same powers that have released us. We don't have autonomy or control over capitalism. It seems to be running away, right? History over the past two to 300 years has been a ramping up of temporal intensity, breakthroughs and revolutions and disruptions. So many 20th century theorists talk about this feeling of kind of being in a whirlwind. I, I love uh, William Gibson's discussion on this, where he says like, we're in a howling wind tunnel, right? And we no longer live in, in, a, in a present with a sufficient now to stand on. It's just sort of crisis management. So this, in, this same freedom of self is also this same feeling of powerlessness of the forces that that self has unleashed. So this is, again, going back to that sense of liminality. Like when we talk about freedom and individual and modernity and industry, we're also talking about the time crisis, the historical crisis, technology run away, the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene. So they come together, they come together. So the question is still here and it's still present, which is, okay, so we have the self, we don't wanna undo it. How do we get past this somehow? How do we supersede the ego and the self and modernity without necessarily undoing it? And I don't think necessarily that simple aphorisms of transcend and include or you know okay let's like fold that in and move to the next stage those don't actually answer the question of how to do that right so i don't know exactly either but i would say that um in the process of now retrieving this this orientation of coming down to earth there's new freedom that's allowed i mean there's literally existential freedom from not wiping out humanity right in 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 uh you know what could very well be as if we believe what jim Del jim bendel is talking about like um a mass species die off that would take us out in the process so um the ego has a right to exist and and civilization perhaps too but not at the ex extent or expense of ecocide and civilizational suicide which is where we're headed so how do we overcome the self is the same question as how do we overcome civilization and, and what the modern self has brought forward in our time. And none of us have the, the answer to that. But I, again, I think the answers are appearing in all of these different modalities, all of these different practices and theorists from Brewer's work to Michelle Bowen's work, what Gepser is talking about, what Latour is talking about, the coherence and the thematics are there. Um, and I'll just uh, end with one note on what, something Tehard de Chardin often talked about, where he said, you know, in the process of planetization, um, the overcoming of the self can't just be the dissolution, it has to be the suprapersonal. So where does the personal and the human and the individual be retained um, in this new world? Let's look to that. Where are those success stories, right? Um, and again, I think that has to do with um, being human again. Uh, again, the pandemic allowed us to take a breath, many of us, ironically, as it was taking our breath away in that sense. It allowed us to begin to inhabit modes of human time, rhythmicity, being stuck in a place for a long time with other people. Um, uh, contemplation, the slowing down of the day, you know, those kinds of very human things that we had before um, the one the one sided directional uh, you know modern pace of life really just totalized everything in in mark fisher 's capitalist realism so okay that 's actually a way to be more human that 's a way that the modern industrial egoic self lost actually and was in the process of undoing so it, it's a very complicated question about what the modern self is actually achieving and how that is very kind of um, mm, limited right or, or or fragmented in that sense i don't know if that if that directly answered that question or not but i got a thumbs up from ron so yeah. it looks like we're good <laughs> yeah absolute poetry to me uh i i would like to hear jacob's question about narratives if jacob would like to unmute himself Maybe he stepped out. Let's see who else has a question. Um, Bart, it looks like you also had a question for Jeremy, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hello. 
Yep. Um, hey, Jeremy. So, um, <clears throat> I heard you mention, um, or you, you put a Rudolf Steiner quote in the chat yesterday. Um, and I've heard you, you know, talking about um, the idea of reversal. Um, that's kind of an image that I've been sitting with for a while. Uh, but I've noticed, I've noticed that the, the anthroposophical kind of thread of thought is like somehow not finding its way to um, the game B conversation. And um, just thinking like about the idea of the, uh, see if I can do this in a good way. Like um, the idea of the reversal of the folk soul and kind of this uh, mimetic tribes as like having the potential to be um, game B communities and what, uh, what somebody recently told me that Steiner referred to as uh, new Mike Ayala communities. Yeah, good question. Um, I, I, I am relatively new to the game B communities. Like, so I, I don't really know the ins and the outs. I've really just been exposed a little bit to, you know, Jim Rutt's material, Jordan Hall and Schmachtenberger talking um, here and on Rebel Wisdom and, and elsewhere. But um, yeah, I, I think yeah. the part of this, right, it is, is how much of a post-materialist or a-materialist um, phenomenology are we going to allow ourselves to reintegrate and remediate? I don't think that a post-capitalist future that retrieves the village, et cetera, is going to be um, the same kind of secular um, anthropology that moderns and westerns have been engendering. You know, maybe part of them will, you know, and maybe Game B is more interested in kind of looking at metasystemics and game theory, et cetera. But part of this, and this is sort of what I really like that Steiner is bringing up, of course, but then Gebser also really frames very, very usefully is the sense of, okay, well, we are not merely modern. So like the, the, there's other modes of being in the world that continue to persist um, as if that's, you know, humanity is the integrality of their mutations. So the magical, the mythical, the soul oriented, the folk oriented, all of those capacities not only continue to exist, but also involve themselves in rational thinking and in secular culture in a sort of invisible ways. So I'm kind of interested more in this sort of this anthropological turning where we're actually bringing that back in as well. Um, and I don't think everyone needs to in that sense. We all have different dispositions, but I do think that's part of the part of the story here and only framing it in terms of kind of systems thinking and secularity is a, is a very kind of a Western centric modernity centric uh, way of thinking about this planetary crisis and evolution. Whereas, you know, this look at the majority of human beings on the world and on the planet have not been necessarily secular in that sense. And still today, right? It's their transformation too. You know, um, it's not just the secular West's uh, um, uh, planetary culture. So I, I, I think there's a plurality that we have to consider. Um, and certainly, like, I think with the consciousness culture, obviously, like, we talk about Steiner and psychedelics and spiritual experiences, et cetera. Um, um, and of course, engaging with indigenous cultures and uh, First Nation cultures and communities that are still present today. So again, I think it's a more pluralistic universe, you know, and that's part of what the turning could be in that deeply phenomenological sense. It's, it's, it's an overcoming of our own, and this is an inquiry and a, an invitation for us, I think. It's an overcoming of our own fixation on the phenomenology that has, you know, so identified modernity for so long, spatial orientation. Um, we can get into like more of that detail, but um, yeah, I, I think it's, this is an opening up, you know, 
This is not meta modernity. This is meta something else, meta planetary planetization. I don't know. I don't know. There's no words for it. But um, I think part of this is exploring that as well. I'm not sure if that directly answers your question about game B and the anthroposophical views and, and such, but yeah. Awesome. We're getting um, kind of near the end, so there'll probably only be uh, one or two questions left, but I'd be really interested to hear from Fred about his question if uh, he'd like to unmute himself. We can't hear you. There you go, that should work. Uh, well, Jerry and we know each other because uh, I'm a fan of his Gebser course. And uh, to me, Gebser has, has uh, a very important thing to say. We go from, uh, it's, it's an evolutionary uh, development in which he says, at the moment we go from the mental to the integral. And I feel that the integral has, has definitely an uh, inherent spiritual aspect to it. And so also transparency and also the word fairy tongue are part of the value system. If I look at uh, what is happening with George Floyd, if we want to be present, <laughs> that's very much what is on each uh, let's say, uh, inner and outer screen, is what I see definitely by young people is that there is a very deep feeling of equality that wants to show up. And in that sense, uh, this, this, there is this shift from this racial thing, which has very much to do with kind of the, the, the white people being very mental and now shifting to something that is inviting more a deeper variety. So that's that's what brings me into the the feeling of uh, why not look at the the aspect of which of the values that we see now showed up, which I think is universal love is part of what we are going, and that equality has very much to do with that. And so instead of, I, I find that going very in very difficult head concepts, going into a more feeling concept of, could that be possible that the human uh, stage that we are coming into now is heart-based? And from there, let's say, different value systems are going to be, let's say, created also, which will also deeply affect the, let's say, the, the, the value of uh, what we call the, uh, you know, to be a genius is being very rich. What we now see in the, in the crisis is that people with so-called common professions like teachers and are seen as well. <laughs> So, so there's a deep value shift in those aspects. So I would love to, 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 if the liminality is perhaps also an uh, acknowledgement of the need for an emotional maturation. Mm. Yeah, I think that, that gets to well, part of the heart of it, right, Fred? Um, good question. I think, first of all, if we take what Gebser says at least, and I think other theorists about cultural evolution discuss. Um, I'm thinking of Ursula K. Le Guin's line from uh, one of my favorite essays by her, uh, California as a non-Euclidean place to be. Um, it's a strange title, but uh, where she says, you know, we've been so, this is just, this is the problem. We've been so over-oriented towards this one-sided fixation, towards abstraction, towards the mental, towards spatialization, towards uh, sort of a directed mechanism, an industry that has so much momentum that, uh, that our, our sense-making is so oriented around the mental, it's so fixated, that a reversal is, is almost, it is the intelligence uh, of, um, I don't know what you would call it, of the itself that Gebser talks about that is 
or the Tao, I suppose, maybe Le Guin would say, that is calling forth a reversal, a reorientation, a restructuring. The alive order is, is, is asking of it, of itself, right? And the crisis is revealing that of itself, that reversal, return, release, stop over abstracting, stop, you know, you know that kind of um, arc of modernity is being inverted and reversed in all of its tendencies, all of its sense-making tendencies, because it's been so one-sidedly fixated it's going to destroy us if we continue that way. And the answer is not to continue pedaling harder that way either, right? So in terms of heart-centered, yes, but also and gut-centered and mind-centered, like, and this is the whole, this is the McLuhan turn, this is the integral turn with Gepser. This is the simultaneity of all of our cultural modes of expression and sense-making are what the planetary dynamics of complexity are calling for. It's not just the heart. It's also the gut. It's also the mind, right? There's a, the, the idea or the, 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 the key characteristic here is bringing that all forth. And part of, I think, the process today in this crisis has been the heart because that does need to be remediated, the human centris, uh, centrism, the mutual aid, right? That's been a theme of this pandemic. It's been a theme of the, of the riots in this sense, this anger, um, about the loss of life and the failure of these institutions to to care, right? So, yeah, I mean, that there's this sort of dehumanization and alienation from self and other that this form of culture has so um, so successfully produced. That yes, the reversal is needed, but the reversal is not just an undoing; it's a retrieving and integration. Um, and I think that's that's the the challenge we're trying to work through. Um, because what we see right now is, you know, a lot of overemphasis in some degrees of things that have been unintegrated, that have been sloughed off, that have been disintegrated. And part of that is, yes, the commons, human centrism, mutual aid, a society that and engenders that and values that at, at its center. Those are all things that are easy enough to cohere about and go, yeah, those all need to come back online. I would just say like as a distinguish, as a discernment, it's not just the heart, it's the whole being really that, that is being um, invoked in this time. If we don't respond to the whole, we will be undone by the, the complexity of the whole, right? Like that's what I'm, I'm feeling, but certainly the heart again, certainly the soul again, right? Um, I don't know if we want to equate those two, but heart, soul, and, and, and a living world, right? In every way that means from the magic and mythic to um, the, the kind of sciences that Haraway and Lynn Margulis talk about and uh, Nora Bateson talks about. So, yeah. Could I, could I bring in one, one thing that I, let's say, I, uh, I just found, let's say, two weeks ago, the idea that if we really look back from, let's say, uh, evolutionary point of view, we have now, and let's say, for the first time, we have a cosmogenesis, a biogenesis, and with Gebser, a homogenesis stages. And uh, I had this idea of the, the shift from, let's say, the, the hominid, the, the, the ape. He lives in a world in which, let's say, the, the, uh, there is very much the prey and the predator. And what I see the human being kind of integrating is in itself the prey and the predator. We are also victims and we are creators. And in a certain sense, if you then see that the feminine could be, let's say, related to the prey, because the defense, the looking out is a dangerous not, and the male more oriented is what is possible, there's a completely, I feel there's a very rich thing that comes in us to connect to the natural world. And coming down- We are at the top of the hour, so I'm just gonna interject myself now. Um, but I am happy to keep this space open uh, and uh, hold uh, a sense-making session after for any of you who do have lingering questions. For now, I'm going to toss it to Peter to say some uh, closing remarks, though. 
Thank you, maybe. Um, and uh, thank you for the excellent uh, emceeing today. This is uh, uh, Maybe's first emceeing. She's going to have her own series called Raw Sexuality here at the STOA, which we're super stoked for. Um, and Jeremy, thanks so much for coming today, my friend. That was an awesome talk. Um, and, and I think I, I told you before, uh, when we were corresponding before this, like I'm super open for collaboration with the STOA and Liminal News. And I was actually thinking of doing like a STOA, uh, like a stoic news channel every night, just to kind of like sense make what the heck is happening. So I'm not watching the news anymore. And I get triggered when I see all these, like, like when my body gets hijacked, but it'd be good to have like a calm space where we can actually sense make what's actually happening that isn't out of the situation. Um, so maybe we can uh, double click on that later. So um, in a moment, I'm gonna hand it back to Maybe, and she's gonna uh, lead a sense making session. I'm gonna have to leave right now, but whoever can stay here and wants to chat a little bit more, uh, we have the space uh, open for a while, so we can do that. Just gonna plug a, a couple of events that are coming up. Um, so tonight, we uh, later today, not tonight, we have uh, two events out of our Wisdom Gym. We have a relational exegesis with uh, Jessica, and that's 4 p.m. Eastern time. We're reading a, a Finite and Infinite Games with James Kars. And the idea of this psychotech is building a relationship with the text while we build it with each other. And top secret, or maybe not so top secret, but James Kars agreed to come to the STOA. So hopefully we can land uh, a time here. He was uh, on my podcast previously fucking geeking out over that. Um, and then uh, we have a shame breakthrough bootcamp with uh, uh, everyone's favorite shame educator, AJ Bond. That's at 6 p.m. Eastern time today as well. Uh, and tomorrow we have a really cool event, a bio emotive framework, an introduction. Um, could you uh, introduce that uh, maybe because I know you, you've experienced this uh, modality. Yeah, uh, tomorrow we have uh, Doug Tatterin coming by at 4 p.m. Eastern to talk about his bio emotive framework. Um, it's a synthesis of his like decades of uh, background in statistical analysis and like clinical psychological work. Um, but it, he also has a really strong grounding in mindfulness practices and uh, Eastern uh, religious uh, pra practices that are um, being westernized a lot right now. Um, his framework uh, helps you find core feelings in your emotional um, understandings, uh, understand the difference between those and social and survival emotions, helps you update your impressions, update your beliefs about your own feelings, um, and it helps you uh, fully experience what your emotions are so that you don't end up having like these lingered half resolved feelings floating around in your body and weighing you down. So I think that it's, it's, it's just an amazing, amazing process. It has absolutely changed my life. I, it, it feels, feels so cliche to say that, but it, it, this time is actually true. Uh, I went through like profound physical, mental, spiritual, emotional change in just a weekend of working with Doug. Um, he feels like a father to me now, actually. He just has like that warm dad energy. So if you need some warm dad energy, make sure you come by tomorrow for sure. Beautiful. Uh, thank you. And if you uh, want some warm mom energy, we have uh, Rhea Beck, uh, who's come uh, does collective presencing at, uh, I think it's 12 p.m. Eastern time. So yeah, the idea is that with this uh, ecology of practices is sort of organically emerging here at the STOA, and uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, I'll, I'll just plug another thing. Tyson, are you, are you uh, presentable uh, right now? You got something that's really related to today's uh, event on Saturday. You're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, the event on Saturday is called Flowing with Unknowingness. And it's experimenting with freestyle, rap, and spoken word as a psychotech or a practice for deepening our relationship with uncertainty through creative self-expression. And then aiming that experience toward reaching group flow and seeing if we can create a dialogue amongst us and really engage that emergent energy through the form of freestyle. So it's like dialogos, but it's, it's sort of, held and lubricated by musicality and instrumentals and beats. And uh, it's been a lot of fun for me. And it's a good way for me to learn about the people in this community and yeah. get to them much more deeply. Totally. And maybe, and I can uh, attest as a fucking awesome uh, psychotech. Uh, so the STOA is based off the gift economy. You can go to this page. Uh, if you're inspired to provide a gift to the STOA, myself, the steward, or any of the facilitators here, you can go there um, and we'd be greatly appreciating uh, your gift. That being said, everyone, thanks for coming out today. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jeremy.